live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and tonight we're talking with the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. Joining me this evening is Rupal Maida Saran, who is the executive director of LCNV, which is how you shorten your name. That's correct. <laughs> and you've been there for all of six months, so welcome both Thank to you. your new job and to our show. Thank you very much. So one of the things I wanted to highlight was last year in 2017, Parade Magazine named the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia as the outstanding charity for Virginia, and that is quite an accomplishment. Yeah, we were absolutely thrilled. We were honored to be present with the list of other charities that were on the list from all over the country and the opportunity to share a little bit about what we do in such a national fashion with over 750 newspapers was quite a thrill. No kidding. And so, so I was saying before the show, you know, the Literacy Council has been around for a long time, 55 years. And if you'd asked me yesterday, so what do you think the Literacy Council does? It would be different than my answer today after your communications director so kindly told me about the amazing programs that you are developing and have developed. Start back at the beginning and tell us a little bit about the genesis of the Literacy Council. Sure, so the Literacy Council was founded by a couple of volunteers who were concerned about what they were seeing in terms of people's ability to read and write. Uh, we were started, as you mentioned, 55 years ago, mostly serving a native English-speaking population who could speak English, but were having trouble with reading and writing. Uh, we started out with pretty much a one-on-one -on -one sort of tutoring uh, methodology that moved over to a classroom-based learning as time went on. Now, if you look at the population that we serve, we're serving primarily an English as a second language population with our students coming from 95 different countries and speaking over 50 languages. So we operate in about 14 different locations throughout Arlington, Fairfax, Falls Church, and Alexandria. And we offer classes at the lowest levels. We're talking about students who are at the sixth grade level or below in English and uh, offering them an opportunity to learn reading, writing, comprehension uh, in our classroom setting. So you, you're, you mentioned the, you know, the population is very international here in Northern Virginia, so literacy councils el elsewhere might have a slightly different population of people who are struggling with literacy. And so you know, you've had to sort of transform your, your program from English speakers to people who might be quite frankly quite educated in their own language but now they've got to learn this whole new language. And this is kind of a foundation for finding a job. Absolutely, and so you raise a very good point. We do serve students who may be all the way from being pretty much illiterate in their own language in the sense that they can speak their language but may not be able to read and write in their own language all the way to people who have advanced degrees right. in their own countries and have come to this country and of course don't have the English skills to get a job. So that prompted us in the last several years to develop another program called Destination Workforce. We have had the opportunity to work with a couple of different businesses in the Northern Virginia area to create curriculum specifically to, in the job industry that our students are in. So in addition to learning English, for example, we worked with a hotel in Tyson's, the Doubletree Hilton, and developed a curriculum for their banquet housekeeping kitchen staff that incorporated both learning English along with words that were specific to the jobs at hand. So for example, after taking our class, uh, or before taking our class, a, a customer or guest might walk in and we were hearing that the staff were running away or moving away because they were so nervous to not be able to respond to whatever the guest might need. But after our class, we have heard from the HR staff at the hotel to say that if someone now asks where is the swimming pool or where is the conference room, that some of our students are absolutely thrilled to be able to take them, point to the, in the right direction, and really provide the customer service that you can imagine any hotel would be thrilled to, to be sure that all their staff have. You know, and it is, it's, it's you know, we, don't, we no longer remember what it was like before we knew how to read words. You know, my children when they were three could recognize McDonald's, <laughs> astonishingly <laughs> like, oh, it's McDonald's. <laughs> and so we forget how, well, you know, what it is, what a detriment yeah. it is to go through the world not understanding signs. I have heard a story, a couple of different stories from, uh, in particular, there's one story about the husband of one of our students. Our student is 
illiterate even in her own language and uh, the husband said I've brought her to this country but it's almost like a death sentence and to me that statement has just stayed with me in in the six months that I've been there but it's a story I repeat because you know that you're bringing them here you know that you're going to try to make a life for yourselves here and yet this concern of one half of this you know partnership right. not being able to communicate at all is really scary and when he used the word death sentence I thought gosh we, we really really have to be able to do something about this and we're really thrilled to be offering a couple of classes to a refugee population oh, um, and they're mostly women and they are coming with no literacy in their own language uh, but we're again seeing great gains fill, helping them fill out basic job applications helping them to understand how to answer basic questions that they may be asked at their children's school and so forth so how do you um, first of all how many of the people who help with this are volunteers it sounds to me like this is if you've got 14 locations and you're helping all of these people in all of these different language it takes like an army of people <laughs> we are extremely honored and very fortunate to have the volunteer core that we have uh, we have over between five and six hundred volunteers who work with us on an annual basis and last year uh, those volunteers gave us almost 20,000 hours of service and so you, we'll talk about this a little bit at the end of the show, but who, give us, give me an idea of who some of these volunteers are. Where do they come from? Yeah, you know, I asked the same question when I started and I got a chance to meet many of them and w attended as many different events of ours or classrooms, classes of ours as I could just to get to know who is it that's supporting us. Um, these are people in the community. They live right here. They know our students. Uh, we have a lot of retired educated, highly educated people who want to do something meaningful with the time that they now have that they may not have had before. Uh, those people can you know, go through our training. Every, every one of our volunteers who's going to teach in the classroom goes through our intensive instructor training and then continues to stay uh, current with our methods of teaching as you know, the semesters go by. So where do you look for these volunteers? Do you like partner with like the AARP Volunteer Corps? Are there other places where you kind of get the word out to places where it's more likely that you're going to find volunteers? You know, it's a good question. A lot of it is definitely word of mouth. We do certainly put the word out all over the place through the various chambers of commerce, through other organizations that serve seniors, um, through the community centers all throughout the our general geographic area that we serve and we hold volunteer trainings pretty regularly so every couple of months there's an opportunity to come and get an introduction to what we do and then decide in what way you'd like to volunteer with us. So I'm assuming given that you've got a very international um, client base you're looking for a very international volunteer base as well that must be helpful. Yeah. You know, you'd be surprised. I would say that we do not sort of search for it, um, and we all of our classes are taught in English, and that's by necessity, because in one class of 20 students, you might see <laughs> 25 from, languages. <laughs> exactly, um, and it is also done because our methodology suggests that that is the best way to teach English to these lowest level learners. So we, our volunteers. They come from all over, but that's not sort of by design. Right. Uh, it's really whoever is interested. You know, we're looking for a variety of commitments. So based on what else you have going on, you know, whether you can volunteer with us six hours a week or 10 hours a week or one hour a month, we have something to accommodate you. And so when do you, I'm assuming you're providing classes during the day, but also you must have classes in the evenings and weekends too, because it has to be when people are available. You're absolutely right. We do offer classes during the day, which really captures a crowd of people who work at night or may have children who are in school, so they need to be at home or, or free in the evenings. Uh, and we also offer our classes in, in the evenings. So we've got a lot of classes that are like 10 to 12 during the day in community centers. Um, around the area and then we similarly have classes in the evenings usually 6.30 to 8.30. We are really fortunate to be housed in the James Lee Community Center yes, indeed. in Falls Church and there we've got classroom space, three classrooms as well as office space for us to use as well as a kitchen and so that really does allow us to hold classes right where our staff is all day and into the evenings so that we can touch base with students, get a sense of how learning is going, touch base with our volunteers and teachers.
Yeah, the James Lee Community Center is a really nice facility. It's got parking, but I would assume you need to be in locations where people can get there through public transportation as well. Yeah, that is absolutely right. And so we are lucky to see that there are bus lines that come right by the James Lee Community Center. And in fact, I uh, was just getting over there later this afternoon today and saw a school bus that stopped right in front of the center. The center offers a variety of programming for kids, for adults, for seniors, for you know sports and such. So we are really fortunate to be in a community center where we can spread the word about the courses that we offer and we're running into people from all over to understand what their needs might be. And that, um, how many people end up being kind of walk-ins? They come to the community center for one thing and discover that mm -hmm. There are literacy pro there's a literacy program. Yeah, you know, it's hard to tell exactly because we offer our classes in community centers all over, from Herndon to Chantilly to Lorton to Springfield to Falls Church in Alexandria. Uh, we, uh, and all of those centers have our materials and we try and put up flyers about our right. classes and certainly before registration starts, really try to encourage all of those locations to publicize the fact that English classes are starting and if you're interested, come to our registrations. So we as I mentioned, get a lot of traffic by word of mouth and I think by other people who may be going into all of these centers for a variety of reasons. So what is the cost structure? I mean, is there a fee? Is it a, is it a sliding scale fee or is this all done through donations? You know, we are the lowest cost option in a situation where there's really no other option to learn English at this lowest level. So we're pretty much your best bet in many, many ways. We charge $75 for a semester of classes that includes the cost of the books as well as the That's testing. Great. So it's really a good deal and it's important to us to keep this very, very affordable. So we certainly always are looking for contributions to help with anyone who may not be able to pay that full amount. So that's good to know, Sue. So you have some sort of needs assessment, possible scholarship or whatever. That's right. Yeah, but yeah, but I would also agree too that people need to have skin in the game. Generally you find when people have invested in something, no matter how much it is, they have a tendency to show up, focus, and expect to get something out of it. I think that's true, and I think that's true no matter who you are, whether you have money or you don't have money. Right. You know, if you've put a little bit of money into something, then we we do feel that we see greater attendance, better retention, you know, greater likelihood of really taking the class seriously. So that is a big reason why we do charge. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. I think it's important because, again, you, you pay for the books, you pay for the class, and you're going to show up. And after this break, I want to ask you a little bit more about the different levels of classes that you have, okay. starting with the lowest level and how long people stay with you. Great. So, Please join us after this break. We are talking to Rupal Saran. She is the executive director of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. They've been around here for 55 years, and I bet there are things you don't know about, about what LCNV provides. So join us after the break. tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. Oh! Checking your fantasy loop? Nah, just my 401k statement. Hmm. Nice. Where'd you find the money for that? I've just been saving a little every month. <laughs> I can't seem to save anything. Well, what about all this? What about the money you're spending? <laughs> what money? It's gone before I can get my hands on it. I got a pizza for a Todd. Hey, can somebody spot me? When it comes to financial stability, don't get left behind. It's 547. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org.
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. We are talking with Rupal Saran, who is the Executive Director of the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about illiteracy as most people probably understand it, which is English-speaking Americans who, for whatever reason, graduated from school. Some, some people graduated from college, <laughs> athletes most famously, <laughs> and who are illiterate. And what is functional illiteracy? I mean, how explain to us how you define it and who the people are that make up those 34 million. Most people don't know that there are 34 million adults living in this country who don't have literacy skills, reading skills, math skills at above the third grade level. Okay, third grade, wow, that's pretty basic. <laughs> We have the opportunity to offer classes at that lowest level. In our community, we do have public schools related adult education programs, but most of them need you to be at a middle school level or, or higher. So we find that students may go to the Fairfax County Public School adult education program and be turned away because their English is not at a level to be able to enter those classes, and then they get referred to us. That's a great collaboration then. It's a fantastic collaboration and it really proves to us that we are offering something that doesn't really exist anywhere else. And so if these students can't get into those programs, they have nowhere else to go. Um, they're able to come to the Literacy Council and we divide our classes into three levels, levels one, two, and three. Uh, we do a pretest for every student that comes through our door during our registration period so that we get a sense of where to place them and also so that we can see at the end of the semester how they have done or how, what, what um, gains they may have had. And we offer levels one, two, and three in most of our locations. We also ad additionally offer some special conversation classes as well as some writing classes above and beyond the basic literacy classes. We are fortunate to still have some tutoring that we do. So it's typically for students who are already enrolled in our programs who might be interested in working, um, for our volunteers who are interested in working with those students <clears throat> beyond the classroom. Yeah, mentoring, so I sit on the board of Bright Paths, and we do a lot of financial mentoring both in classes and one-on-one, -on -one. and we have found that for students who've been vetted and are highly motivated, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring can have a remarkable, make a remarkable difference because you have to pick the students who are the ones most likely to succeed and who are most focused on actually doing the work necessary. Mm -hmm. So when people volunteer, I'm assuming they can volunteer to be classroom instructors as well as people can volunteer to be one-on-one -on -one mentors. It's a good question, and so what we have done is we have found that the classroom-based learning seems to be the most effective for teaching English as a second language. So right. to our lowest level learners, having a, several students be in a room together, or working with an instructor in a textbook with several classroom aides and volunteers in the room is most helpful. For students who need a little bit of additional help or, additional, or want additional help, then having the one-on-one -on -one tutoring option does seem to assist them, but we do feel strongly that they should be enrolled in our classroom. As well, as well. right? So mm -hmm. not to skip that part, but simply right. to go through that part and then figure out if you need something more. Right. Do you ever run into situations where people are struggling with something like undiagnosed dyslexia as, as the root of their <laughs> illiteracy? Yeah, you know, and it, it is something that is entirely possible, and it is something that some of our volunteers may have a sense of, but we haven't asked them to be trained or we haven't trained them in identifying that issue particularly. If they have a concern about a student or a special concern, they certainly should be talking to our staff and our faculty support advisor to see <clears throat> if there's any other recommendations that we might wanna make for that student. That's the only reason that is top of mind is because Decoding Dyslexia Virginia is a group of parents who are trying to get, they've been trying to get testing at the lowest levels like in kindergarten instead of waiting for kids to, basically it's the wait to fail model in third grade. And so it makes me wonder, you know, how many adults who've struggled with illiteracy really have undiagnosed dyslexia and the fact that really it, it should be before kids even start to read. Oh, it's a really good point. Because most of our students are English as a second language, it is something that would take us a little bit longer yeah, it to would catch, be harder right? to detect. You just wouldn't know necessarily as quickly. We do have another uh, program that we call student advising 
And it is really, the idea of it is for volunteers who are interested in helping our students kind of more on their ongoing pathway to being in this country and being a part of this community. So someone that can help them think through what are your goals? Are, what are your goals with respect to your children, with respect to navigating the school district, with respect to understanding your own health needs and being able to read a medicine bottle? Let's come up with what those goals are. And we find that for some people, this is the first time anyone is sitting down with them to help them to think through what their goals, as small as they may seem to some I of us. I think they're critical. I mean, I, I, until you just said that, I'm thinking, well, there has to be a priority list. Like, what is the priority that you have to figure out? And I would assume being able to read forms if your children are in public school, that's a huge one. Medicine is a huge one. Healthcare right. is a huge one. Transportation right. would be a huge one. Right. So we offer, we offer a lot of different programs, um, all kind of thinking about what pathways our students need to become more able to participate in their communities and more able to sort of access job employment opportunities and other educational opportunities. Right, so you've got people who are coming over here and besides the basic necessity of being literate, you've got people who might want to go on to further their education here, but clearly workforce development, and I'm intrigued by the fact that you're actually working with Double Tree Hotels, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that must be the local one here within the district you serve. Right. So there's not necessarily a national thing they're doing, it's just a partnership with the local. That's correct. We, have worked, we had the opportunity to work this past year with the Tyson's Corner Hilton Doubletree, and they, as I mentioned earlier, were interested in creating a program for some of their staff. They identified which ones they thought could most benefit and most likely be up for promotion by improving their English skills. In other words, uh, staff that were doing a great job, were getting good reviews in many ways, but could stand to gain improvement in English and that that would really significantly help them along in their career. And like that, we have had the opportunity to work with senior living facilities, and we are exploring opportunities to develop the curriculum to be able to work in other job industries, say, like construction industry or food service industry um, and, or housekeeping or um, home housekeeping industry to try to see where the need might be that by enhancing someone's English, we could see them really, their job pathway be enhanced. I think that's fantastic, and it seems to me so is, is your doorway into these collaborations with businesses the chambers? That's what it has been. We definitely have started our relationships in many cases with collaborations with chambers of the local areas that we, that we are in. Uh, but we're also one-on-one -on -one going into you know, companies' corporate social responsibility, starting there, explaining what we do, and then asking to talk to their HR directors to see what sort of professional development is being offered to this lowest level of staff. Uh, we have learned a lot. We have found that some companies outsource a lot of this work, so they don't have you know, the janitors and the kitchen staff. They outsource that wow. work. So we're trying to you know, figure, figure out what are the companies the contractors, are, right? Right. What are the companies that are doing this that could really benefit from this, that have the quantity of people to make it worthwhile for them to be able to do a class like this? As a nonprofit, you know, we're always looking to raise money. And so, as we mentioned earlier, our fee of $75 per student for our regular English classes, you know, it doesn't really cover the cost of what it takes for us course, to teach that yeah. number of students. And at the same time, we are committed to not raise that price because we believe that we want access to our classes to all students. So our real hope is that this destination workforce program or this ability to go to companies and see if they're willing to work with us where we would work directly with their managers, understand what is the language, what is the Hilton way, what is um, important for in, in terms of their culture or corporate culture to make sure that their employees are learning and then accordingly develop a curriculum that matches with that and ideally be paid for that so that we could see that as a new revenue stream and I think a unique and creative and sort of entrepreneurial um, revenue stream that would also draw attention to us for other funders who like the idea of us going after something in a slightly different way. I do too. I mean, when you've got a good workforce who show up and they're, they're good workers, it seems to me this is really uh, an investment in taking your own staff that are already, you're, they're already on your payroll right. and lifting them up so that they have a chance to advance in yep. your organization. In the example with the Hilton, we uh, within a few months after taking the class, one person was promoted and several others, we were told, uh, just had such a higher comfort level in interacting with people, with fellow staff members, and, and that's the other thing. 
so often we are hearing that coming from another country, it's not the easiest thing to pick up on the soft skills that Americans may naturally have or that American workplaces naturally have. So understanding for someone who may have grown up in another country where you don't ever say no to a supervisor and understanding that here in the United States you can say no, but it, how do you do so and how do you explain where you're coming from and how do you do it in a way that that make sure that the relationship is not, you know, bothered or ruined. Uh, it is. It, it's something that's worth teaching them because for them to understand those soft skills and how to get along with colleagues and others, in addition to the guests, which might have come more naturally because they may have seen that before in their other in their own country, is a, is another thing that we're trying to teach. Yeah, you know, I didn't even think about that, but so much of culture is based on language and understanding mm -hmm. the language. Otherwise, how do you interpret what's going on around you? Right. No, you know, if you're in a hotel and you call and ask for towels, and I may not be the person who's actually going to get you the towels, but I've answered the phone, and I need to know whether to say yes or yes, they'll be right up, or right. yes, someone will be right up, or not to say no because I'm not the one who actually is going to get you the towels. So, you know, it's a simple example, but, um, but we always want to think about how to make them learn this so that they'll actually be confident to use what they've learned. And I just think the idea of doing this with a business, because you're basically offering to customize it to their industry, right. to their workplace, to their location, I can't think of a better investment and what a great partner you've been around for 55 years doing this quite successfully. Yes, and I mean our staff has advanced degrees in curriculum design, in education, in psychology, in English as a second language. Our staff is, is really well versed in how to do this and then on top of that how to do this for adults, which is kind of a whole different ball game in many ways. So it is our hope that employers who do see this as a valuable set of employees to invest in you know, would be ready and excited to come to us and say, sure, come talk to us. Let us tell you a little bit about our industry, our culture, the vocabulary that's important to us, and develop something and let's try it out. Oh, I think that's I think it's so remarkable. And how many staff do you have? I mean, we talked. You have a lot of volunteers, like right. you know, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds, and hundreds yep. of them. But like, what what is your core staff? Uh, we have 15 staff members. We that's all work small out of James for what Lee. you're doing. We think so, but we are small and mighty, and we're really proud of it. And we've got a fantastic group of people that are extremely committed, very hardworking, and always coming up with ways to make what we do better. We don't sit still, and we don't rest on any laurels. <laughs> well, I love the fact that you're so nimble, and you've done so much with so few people, because I do understand how that works. And a little bit later, we're going to be talking to your volunteer and outreach coordinator uh -huh. in one of our segments, because it seems like she's got a very big job as well. So when we return from this break, we will be talking with the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. We've got a lot more information about how you can connect, whether you're an employer or you're a potential volunteer or you know someone who might need these services. So join us. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. change the world. Yeah, you. Getting that college education. I dare you to be somebody important. Like be a teacher. Or a reality TV star. I dare you to stand up here. To call the shots. To be a role model. An inspiration. An innovator. To be a teacher. 
Think you can change my life? Make me excited about science like you? Have a career that really means something? Then do it. I dare you. They say you don't have to be so strong. But this is my mother, my purpose. Strength is not optional. See, I lift her now like she raised me then. So I know my strength is super, but I'm still human. Oh, well, look who's here. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Tonight, we're talking with the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. The executive, for, for, executive Director, Rupal Saran, is here with me in this segment to talk about this very interesting program, Destination Workforce, which is something developed by the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia. Yes, Destination Workforce was developed by us a couple of years ago. We really felt strongly that with the interest from state, national, and local funding for workforce development and job readiness, that it would behoove us to incorporate those skills into our English classes. And given the population that we serve and knowing that many of them are currently working and or looking for jobs, it seemed even all the more important to make sure to incorporate a class that could teach them English but could also specifically guide them in job readiness and in, in English that would enhance their job abilities. Uh, we were really fortunate in the last couple of years to get funding from Accenture to be able to do kind of a market research on what the interests might be in this Northern Virginia area, what companies are here, who their employees are, uh, how many of them have their own staff that are at that lower level in terms of their English proficiency. And in doing that market research, it's given us a nice kind of jumping off point to be able to select other companies and other industries to go after. We're actually really fortunate to just have received another grant just in the last few days um, from Accenture to continue that work and to continue to develop another job industry strand of curriculum, which we would also then take and be able to market out to companies in that field. Um, we have been really fortunate to have companies be interested in supporting this. I think they see that it's a new idea and it's a good idea and it can be a win-win-win for everybody. It would certainly be a win for their employees, which then translates into a win for the company in being able to have employees that are smoother in their customer service skills, um, be able to navigate job and HR situations more readily. And it's a win for the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia also to get the word out to show other companies that we're able to do this and make it worth your while. Um, we also, in the last year, had a chance to um, add Salesforce into our systems. And this is pretty unique for a nonprofit of our yep. size. We were given a pro bono project by Acumen to help us do an analysis of what a new data program would be useful to us. As you can imagine, we're not like some nonprofits that only need a donor database, but because we've got the number of students we have, over 1,500 in a year and over 50,000 in our history, we also needed a program that was almost like a community college's higher uh, education data model, something right. that helps us track registrations, helps us track student fees, uh, and then helps us track a student's test scores at the beginning of the semester and then again at the end of the semester so that we can track and be able to report what our gains were. So in addition to a donor database, in addition to a volunteer database, we have also uh, found that, well, Acumen suggested that Salesforce would be a good program for us to use. We have gone through all kinds of training. Our whole staff is trained in Salesforce and everybody knows how to use it and we're really trying to act like a, you know, a business in terms of how we keep track of the work that we do and how we're able to report what we do. You know, that, that, and you're right about that. The Salesforce is a very powerful platform. And so, and you're right, most nonprofits are not in that league or in that category to use something like that that's really intended for business. But the, the striving to be professional is something, like I said, I'm on the board of Bright Pads, and we talk about that all the time, right. is the fact that no matter how, what the size is of your nonprofit, you strive to be professional in your staff, mm -hmm. in the delivery of your services, to make it efficient, you know, to track progress, to be able to look at your metrics, and also, because grant, makers want that information too. Right. So that is really remarkable. No, and it's a big leap of faith to spend that kind of money on a system, make sure that everyone genuinely buys into it. Because to have it and not use it and not 
have it be part of the norms of office workings, it's a big waste then. So we really have our board to thank for being willing to take that leap with us and agree to spend to be able to implement it. And then certainly to our staff for taking the time to go through countless hours of training. And we still have you know, certain staff members who continue to be trained. We're fortunate to work with our Salesforce provider in this area called Fionta. And they are great <laughs> in terms of being able to call on them and, and have them assist. And we have implemented Salesforce really well. We know there's a lot more that we can do with it, and so we really do look forward to continuing to add on to the knowledge that we well, have. Well, I'm very impressed. I mean, that is really a very powerful, that is a big investment, but I think it also says that you're looking to scale, and workforce right. development is something everybody who works with a certain population of people here in Northern Virginia is looking at. I mean, doing financial literacy and mentoring is all well and good, but you right. still have to help people get better paying jobs. Mm -hmm. So all of us are trying to solve similar problems for similar populations of people. So tell us a little bit about collaborations. I mean, you, you talked about your business collaborations. Mm -hmm. What other sort of collaborations do you have? So again, we are so fortunate to be known in the community and to be working with just some of the best organizations that also care so deeply about the same community, the community, and the community that we care about. So from our classes being held in various buildings and sites, other community centers like the Herndon Neighborhood Resource Center, uh, which actually stems from a collaboration that we have with eight other nonprofits in the Herndon that serve the Herndon wow. area called Connections for Hope. Connections for Hope, yes. Between all of us, we do a variety of things from healthcare to housing to immigration services to literacy and others, uh, and work together to share resources and share ideas and say, you know, we can hold our classes here. Can you get some of your clients to come to our classes here? We work in the Lorton Community Center. We have a partnership with the Centerville Immigration Forum. I I'm love working those in people. Their day labor center. <laughs> Um, we work with the Korean Community Service Center in Annandale, and uh, we the collaboration and the opportunity to work with staff over there in these different locations who can tell us a little bit more and educate us a little bit more on their population, which even 10 miles or 15 miles away can be different, you know, yes. and it can it and it. It's helpful. It's helpful in us for us in shaping our classes because our classes really do rely on getting to know what these students need and maybe a little bit about what their circumstances are so that we can be convenient, we can be geographically available to them, we can hold classes at the right times for them, we can go at a speed that seems to work for them. A lot of it does hinge on getting to, to know our population. So the opportunity to collaborate, uh, collaborate with Fairfax County and you know, uh, with the, the neighborhood community and community services, both to get our space at James Lee Community Center, but also to be able to be at other Fairfax County community centers. Um, it allows so that when someone comes to us for a class, we don't have to tell them you can only come to this one location. Our hope is that, you know, we're within reasonable distance of most people who need our services. Well, you know, it's a big area. Fairfax County itself is a huge area, but then when you're talking about Alexandria as well, and mm -hmm. you know, then you're, you're, you're trying to serve an enormous number of people with your volunteers, your 14 locations, and the amount of staff that you have, which is still remarkable to me. That's right. No, uh, we also have some really interesting collaborations, for example, with Computer Corps. Uh, uh, yes. They offer computer classes, mm -hmm. and so we are partnering with them, with Fairfax County and Neighborhood Community Services, uh, to be able to create a class called Converse, uh, Computers in Conversation. There, you know, the emphasis is in trying to make sure that parents in the schools can both understand basic computer skills to be able to help their kids with school. So every Fairfax County parent needs to have a parent account uh, to be able to understand what assignments their children are getting, perhaps right. to see the assessments that their chil children have gone through. Uh, they also need to have an email address. Let's start back there first. They need an email right. address because the teachers are mostly communicating with them through newsletters or emails. And even the, the quick email about remind your child to wear a hat tomorrow because it's Read Across America Day and everyone's right. going to wear a Dr. Seuss hat. And right. if, you can't, if you don't get the email and or you can't read the email, you know, it, it can affect how, what happens to your child. And so this particular course we're working on uh, with this collaboration of partners and Computer Corps so that there is an hour of computer instruction and then an hour of English instruction to coincide with 
becoming a, a bigger part of your children's education. One other collaboration I'll uh, mention is with the Alexandria Public Schools. They have a FACE program, community engagement program for their parents. And in several different schools, as well as in some community centers in some of the apartment complexes in Alexandria, we have been able to offer what we call family learning programs. These are programs where we're in two classrooms. The children are in one classroom and the parents are in another classroom. We teach things separately, give homework assistance to the kids, definitely English training for the adults, but several times during the course, we bring the parents and the kids together to reinforce what they're each learning in their separate rooms. And we have a very sincere belief that this is us working really hard to help these parents really be the first teachers for their kids. So we are really pleased to work with the city of Alexandria to offer five of these family learning programs. Wow, five, that's fantastic. I just had Bossom Khan on here um, last week. He is the executive director of Neighborhood Health, and they provide dental services to eight elementary schools in Alexandria, which always brings me back to one of my favorite subjects, which is community schools, of which we have zero in Virginia. <laughs> but I'm working on it. And community schools are exactly what you're talking about, and that is serving the family mm -hmm. through the childish point of entry and, you know, and collaborating with, part having partnerships with Thing like a literacy program right. for the whole family. Yeah. And these are the kinds of things, like I said, we don't have any community schools in Virginia. Baltimore City has 40 of them. Right. But it's something that I'm working on here in Virginia because we're almost there. It's like between Computer Corps and the Literacy Council in Northern Virginia and Neighborhood Health, you can look at all the different partnerships, but it's not under this particular model of evidence-based education that we know succeeds, that we know works. So I'm going to continue to work on community schools, <laughs> but I do think that what you're describing is in fact the way you meet the needs of families that are new to the area, how you address things like literacy for parents, because it is critically important. You were so right when you said they are their child's first teacher. Yeah, there's so many statistics out there that show that first of all, some 50% of children in Fairfax County are coming home to houses where English is not spoken in the home. And when you match that up with their likely likelihood of succeeding or being a better than average reader, the percentages just are, are, are very low. And so helping the adults is, is I think, you know, some people might think that we've got to teach our kids to read, and we certainly do, but I don't think that teaching our adults to read is any less important. It is, and so the Naomi Project, which is another Bright Pass program, when we work with at-risk moms, new moms and expecting moms, one of the things they get, besides help with doctor's appointments and navigating the healthcare system, they get books for their babies. And they get books for their babies because we know that when you read to infants, it increases the likelihood that they will be successful right. in their academic career. Every time I hear the alarm bell go off in school, I think it's an air raid. A lot of houses in our neighborhood have been destroyed. I like to close my ears and sing songs whenever the bombs come close. I'm worried our new neighbors won't like us. But I know it's all going to be worth it. I just want my family to be safe. But these are not my these words. These are not my words. These are not my words. Protect the planet. I want you to build an ark. Here we go. Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow. Oh, oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. When it comes to saving money, ah, what? Period. Don't act like a baby. Oh, it's like they're having their own little meeting. This is so humiliating. Be the boss. I'm the boss. What the? Mm -hmm. Power nap. You were saying. And make a budget. Let's get to work. Need a little help? Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. 
What's it say? Create a personalized savings plan and get other tools and tips. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. At feedthepig.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. We're talking with the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia tonight. Joining me is Rupal Saran, who is the Executive Director, and also Amy Tristan, who is the Volunteer and Outreach Director. Thank you, ladies, for being here. Yeah, thank you. So tell us a little bit about the process for becoming a volunteer. Walk us through, because I'm sure their viewers are going to be like, this is so awesome, I think I want to do it. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> so every year we have between five and 600 volunteers who get involved with us. So to get started, volunteers come to a volunteer orientation, and that's where they hear a presentation about the history and the mission of LCNV, more information about our academic programs and our learners, and then ways to get involved as a volunteer. So we actually have an orientation that's coming up pretty soon. It'll be on Saturday, March 10th at 10 a.m. Okay. at the James Lee Community Center in Falls Church. And then after that, we'll have another one at the Lorton Library on April 7th. It's a Saturday at 1030. Um, so first, we'd like to have prospective volunteers attend one of those orientations just to hear more about what we do. And then we invite them to fill out an application. And that just gives us more information about their interests and their background and their expertise. And then after that, when we kind of review that together and we sit down with them, I like to have a conversation with them, which is Actually, my favorite part of the job, just getting to know these folks and their experiences and how they can kind of plug into our organization. And then we kind of figure out what would be a good fit for them. And then we have lots of opportunities for training. And so if they want to be in a classroom setting, we have a great instructor training for them. If they want to work behind the scenes, we have some on-the-job sorts of trainings for them in that case. So. So, so a lot of volunteers may not have ever worked with adults in this capacity before, so it's not like teaching children to read. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that one of the yeah. things you find is like teaching adults is not the same is teaching children? Yeah, it's true. I mean, the basic qualifications for our volunteers that they're they're 18 and older, and they speak fluent English and have a high school diploma. So from there, we'll train them. You know, a lot of our volunteers have education experience. They've taught grade school kids, or they've taught college or high school, um, but it's not required for our volunteers. So we'll train them, and we'll plug them in, and we'll support them along the way. Um, but yeah, teaching adults is a little different than it is teaching kids. And I find a lot of volunteers who have worked with kids, they kind of venture into the world of adult education they find they really love it. You know, it's just That's neat great. to work with adults who are so eager to learn, and they're motivated in a lot of ways to really learn as quickly as they can and kind of progress through our program. So how do you schedule them? I mean, five or 600 volunteers, so once they, you onboard them and mm -hmm. you orientate them and mm -hmm. they've applied and you've accepted them, how do you keep all these moving parts? I know that, that Rupal mentioned you've got Salesforce now. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that helps uh -huh. some of the keeping the moving parts organized. Yeah, it is a lot to schedule. So we've got a number of people on staff who, uh, you know, have their hands in lots of spreadsheets and, you know, keeping everybody together. You know, we kind of have a lot of volunteers who serve on a very regular basis, and that really helps with scheduling. So, you know, they'll commit to serve in a certain class for an entire semester. And so they'll be there every Monday and Wednesday, for example, from 6 to 8.30. And so that kind of helps with those sorts of scheduling. But yeah, it's a, it's a big task, and that's a lot of, you know, what I spend my time doing. Um, and I really like that part, actually. So do volunteers want to volunteer mostly where close to where they are or were they are they willing to venture out a little farther you know you mentioned that you've got classes coming up in Centerville and that's kind of a new area for you so will you in addition to looking for people out there will you take some of your stalwart committed volunteers and ask them to go out there? Sometimes it works that way, especially if somebody has some experience that we want to kind of tap into. We might ask them to do a semester in one location, but it almost always works out that, you know, there's a class close to the location where this person works or where they live. Um, and I think that's the advantage of having so many classes all over this area, that there's inevitably a class that they could plug into that's close by. And so when you come up with things like we're, we're starting these new classes in Centerville, you know, how do you know which direction to move to next? How do you map the next location? Yeah, I think we just sort of look at the need, and you know, we have a lot of boots on the ground who are people who are sort of, you know, connected to different um, social service organizations, schools, things like that. Um, so they're listening to you know the people who are in that community, and sometimes they've been asking for classes for a long time, and then we get approached to start a class in that area. So I think that's often how we sort of grow into these areas. We just hear that there's a need, and then we we try to fill that need. And what about finding the appropriate facilities? Because one of the the most remarkable things about 
about your program. With businesses, you're willing to do it on site where their employees are, obviously. But now you've got to find locations for to meet the needs of this emerging population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be a challenge, um, you know, but we have always had good luck, I think, in finding spaces and classroom space. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit of negotiating to figure out, you know, where we can open up a classroom and what the timing is going to look like, um, but it's worked out really well. So describe something, you know, I know community centers mm -hmm. are one of the places where you have classes. Mm -hmm. Do you have them in places like faith communities? Are there, are there people that have space that have offered to work with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we are, because we are always reaching out to different people and because we are really keen to find places that are easily accessible to people with parking or with bus lines. We are reaching out to all kinds of organizations. So it could be schools, it could be the community room in an apartment complex, and we have been able to work with a couple of churches. And we currently are holding classes in Alexandria for a, a, a group of female refugees uh, that the city of Alexandria has supported for us to be able to teach them the lowest level of our English class, probably even below our level one, um, a very entry level class for them that's being held in a church. That's so. Tell me a little bit about the partnership. So, you're collaborating, and you, I'm assuming it's a refugee organization that came to you. I mean, are there other kinds of um, agencies or associations in any of these jurisdictions that are also a pipeline? So, in the in particular with the city of Alexandria, they have funds, federal funds, temporary assistance for needy family or TANF funds that mm -hmm. they get to support these new. Uh, members of their community, so refugees in this particular case, and they want to be able to put them in coursework or training to ideally get them somewhat on their feet or on their feet in the matter of several months or two years. And so they approached us and we have worked with them to develop this low level English class uh, that they pay for their students to attend. They need to hit a certain number of hours of coursework in a week uh, that we're able to offer, which of course is outside the norm, again, of our uh, typical class, but it's something that I think works really well for this population given where their English is at. We also are adding in some job readiness aspects to it. Again, you can imagine at a level for women who maybe are for the first time being taken to the bank and are being taken to the grocery store in our class and are being taken to the pharmacy and are being shown how to use public transportation. Some of them certainly know it better than others um, and they're able to help each other out, but that is key component to this class. So while it may not all be um, what you might always think about as job readiness, it is job readiness in a way to get to know well, how to utilize skills. all these services. I services. mean, I think it's I think it's life skills. Absolutely. Things like the bank and the grocery store were not even things I had thought of, but the, all of that is so document oriented. I mean, you have to be able to read in the grocery store <laughs> just so you know what you're buying. I mean, I know I go to Super H and I'm lost. <laughs> like I have no idea. <laughs> so I have a little yeah. bit, but to, to, to be every place where you really don't know what anything says can be, a, I can imagine, a frightening place to be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and the, the women that we talked to, you know, had a chance to meet several of them in the last in the last couple of weeks and they are really appreciative of the support that they get and just small tidbits of information that we don't even realize that they wouldn't know but it you know it would be around oh you didn't know that the teacher communicates with all the parents via email that's you know that's important so even if for some reason you can't read it make sure that a family member of yours who can read is that email address has been given to the teacher or and and then there's a lot that they're teaching us too, I think I referred to this earlier, about helping us to, as to how to design this course. What do they need? Um, it is so hard to put yourself into somebody else's shoes, but these women are so forthcoming with their experiences, and I think they feel a real comfort level with our instructors as well as being with each other to be able to share, in, in some cases perhaps for the first time, where they're able to really state out loud, I need this, we need this, my family needs this. Um, and I think they feel like we're trying to listen and we're trying to work in cohort with the city of Alexandria, with human services in various places to see what can be offered to help. Well, I'm just awed by your flexibility, you know, your adaptability and your ability to scale, which is so important. So doing your outreach, what kinds of avenues, you know, we talked a little bit about where you put information so people can find it, but you're proactively going out and looking for people. That's true. And we actually have a really great team of outreach volunteers who go into their communities 
and they post flyers for us in libraries or at you know international food stores, things like that. And so they're you know trying to recruit students and to sort of spread the word that these classes exist and that LCMB exists and this is a place that they could come and, and practice their English. Um, and our outreach volunteers also are trying to recruit other volunteers, you know, so they're in the in the community doing that sort of thing. Well, so I'm a Rotarian, which any, anybody who watches this show knows, not only am I a Rotarian, I'm an enthusiastic Rotarian. <laughs> and so, you know, my Rotary Club is uh, Centerville and Chantilly, which is where you're doing these new classes. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of service clubs like Rotary have meetings every week, and they're looking for speakers every week. Kiwanis does, JC does, um, there's women's clubs, there's garden clubs, there's every kind of club. And so would people reach out to you, Amy, if they were looking for a speaker for their weekly club meeting? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'd be happy to go to a club and talk more about what we do and, you know, maybe Rupal would, would come with me as well. Um, but yeah, we love sort of going out into the community. We often show up at community fairs and mm -hmm. back to school fairs, things like that you know, just to sort of spread the word about LCMB as well. Well, the thing I love about Rotary is that we just exist to uh, raise money and give it away to worthy causes, <laughs> which is always good. You should know a lot of people like that. And the fact that that's where a lot of volunteers come from, too. A lot of people, you know, decide to volunteer for organizations who come to speak uh, with our club. So I'm very excited. Tell us a little bit about where people can find you online or how they can call you or email or how can people reach you. Yeah, sure. Our website is lcmb.org. Uh, my email is volunteers at lcnv.org. Um, so as I mentioned, that orientation that's coming up, if someone wanted to come to that, and they could, or they could email me an RSVP for that. Um, or just, you know, with general questions about volunteering and things like that. So. And, and so the calendar, when you've got upcoming orientation events, would it be on your website? It'll be on our website, yes. Yeah, under the events tab. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so um, coming up, how do you see yourself scaling, you know, this destination workforce, which has its registered trademark, I'm kind of impressed <laughs> by that. I mean, is that something for the time being where you're really putting a lot of your effort? We are putting a lot of effort because we are hearing from so many funding agencies that there is a significant interest in job training and workforce development. And because we know that that is the next step that our students, learners need, uh, we're finding that it's a perfect match then for us to get involved in that space. And so scaling is absolutely the name of the game. It's coming up with a certain um, set of curriculums in different job industries, and then being able to pass them, you know, figure out which companies are in those industries to be able to see who can use them. Um, it's looking for volunteers who would be interested in teaching those curriculum and training them as well in something that's sort of slightly different than our basic English classes. But our hope is to, to really be integral in helping our population find their next job or enhance their current jobs. Well, thank you ladies so much for being with us today. This is information I did not know 48 hours ago. <laughs> I knew the, liter uh, the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia back when you were doing things 10 years ago. So I am glad and I hope all of our viewers are delighted to hear what the Literacy Council of Northern Virginia is doing. And look at how you can get involved. 